Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. There are signs that after a very challenging 2009 the recovery may be finally underway, as last quarter results figures show a 2% upswing in international tourist arrivals and point to a growth of between 3 and 4% in 2010, according to the late, latest UNWTO World Tourism Barometer. Though impacted by the economic crisis that uh, swept the world uh, last year, tourism has suffered in many ways less than other sectors. This was possible due to the active support of various governments worldwide, which quickly reacted to the crisis, and also to the amazing capacity that the private sector has shown in adapting to extremely volatile and depressed market conditions. Today we have the privilege of counting with the representatives of some of the countries which have been more active in helping their tourism sector navigate through the, this crisis. And uh, we welcome here Ms. Kumari Selja, Minister of Tourism of India. She also is responsible for another ministerial portfolio, which is the Ministry of Housing and Urban Poverty Alleviation. Ms. Uh, Angela Gereku, Vice Minister of Culture and Tourism of Greece. Mr. Juchan Dion, Vice Chairman of the China National Tourism Administration, and, Ms. and Mr. Christopher Rodriguez, Chairman of uh, Visit Britain, the British Tourism Council, Tourism Board, rather. Together with some of the world's leading tourism companies, and we welcome Mr. Charles Petrucelli, President of American Express Global Travel Services, Dr. Michael Frenzel, Chairman of the TUI Group, and Mr. Jeffrey Kent, Founder, CEO, and Chairman of Abercrombie and & Kent, and also Chairman of WTTC. We will try to shed some light on how recovery is shaping up in different regions of the world, what measures can support uh, recovery in the most effective manner, and how the sector can be more competitive in the post-crisis scenario. Even though this year's forum takes place under brighter expectations as compared to last year's, it's important to remain vigilant and avoid what many call a premature exit from existing stimulus policies, given that some downside risks still remain. There are key issues to be addressed which will affect the way tourism emerges from this crisis and positions itself in the path for sustainable long-term growth. So, I would like to start uh, with uh, Minister Selja. As India has adopted a wide range of measures focused on promotional activities to reduce the impact of the economic slowdown, what are the results so far, Minister, and what do you expect for 2010 in terms of international arrivals and receipts? Well, certainly 2008 and 9 were not as good as earlier, and we saw a few hiccups due to global economic meltdown, as well as um, Mumbai terrorist attacks. And then, of course, the H1N1 scare, which uh, the world saw. But I'm happy to say that um, in the last part of 2009, things uh, seem to be looking up in our country in terms of foreign tourist arrivals. Also, coupled with the fact that our economy is doing better, even last year, uh, our growth was about above 6%, and uh, in the year 2010, we expect to see at least 7% growth in our GDP. All these things, we, we have given stimulus packages in our country and our economy is growing. Apart from that, even the tourism sector has received a boost. We always work in close cooperation with the private sector. Whatever the government announces, first we ask the private sector, the private stakeholders, and they actually shape our tourism products. Okay, Minister, as uh, India is a country 
that has a very large population, so I suppose domestic tourism is also very important. How, how it did, how did it do last year, and uh, what are your expectations for 2010 in both the international and domestic market? Well, certainly um, domestic tourism is very important to us, and I might share with you that uh, our domestic tourism is 100% more than our foreign tourist arrivals. So you can understand that in terms of our Indian context, it was about 560 million domestic tourists uh, in our country. In the coming times, we propose to encourage niche products internationally, for instance. Wellness tourism is uh, something which has caught the attention of the world. We go in for major promotion abroad. We have our road shows. Even within the country, we are having road shows from one part of the country to the other. You can imagine, again, in terms of the huge population that we have, and also in geographical terms, our country is very big. So we are going about it in a very balanced way within the country and uh, outside. In uh, 2010, we have the Commonwealth Games coming up. And again, we are going in for major promotions abroad. And uh, I think coupled both the domestic and uh, international tourism, we certainly look forward to a much better year 2010. And uh, can we expect uh, that uh, this trend will continue to the future because uh, Indian economy uh, really has uh, very good prospects and uh, so we should uh, see in the future that both international and domestic tourism uh, will continue to grow, right? I, I think the world should look towards India because our economy is doing extremely well even when the, I, I really do not wish to sound smug, but even when uh, the, the world was uh, seeing a bit of a downturn, we, we were also affected. But despite that, our economy is robust, it's going stronger, and in the future, we are investing hugely in our infrastructure, in our airports, in our roads, in our railways, in the hotel industry. Many of the international hotel chains are coming to India, and they are expanding. And uh, as far as domestic tourism is concerned, and also international, based on our feedback from our friends abroad, we need to and we are going to um, focus on the budget traveler. Because not everyone wishes to stay in a luxury five-star hotels, but also three-star, four-star, and uh, both the domestic and the international uh, tourist traveler has a lot to look forward to in India in the coming months and years. Okay, well, I think that's all good news for the private sector here. So I would like to hear from uh, Mr. Kent as the chairman of WTTC. Uh, what is your view on the industry's uh, current situation, let's say 2009 and beginning of this year, and uh, prospects for uh, this year of 2010? Well, I've been involved in uh, travel and tourism all of my life, and um, I think we're all, we all agree that 2009 is, is probably the year we all want to forget as uh, quickly as we can. I mean, I think what happened, <coughs> we went from a very powerful growth in 2006, 7, 8, and suddenly in 2009, everything went wrong, and it went wrong very, very fast, which I thought key, you know, took people by surprise. <coughs> to answer your question, we are, you know, we, the Secretary General made a very good talk earlier on, gave us a lot of statistics. I think at the World Travel and Tourism Council, our contribution to GDP is like 4.5% down, uh, from 2008 during 2009. We expect that to recover by, say, a percentage point in 2010. And then going on 2011 onwards, probably grow back to 4% a year, something like that. But I'm, I'm always an optimist about travel and tourism. People, uh, you know, when things get bad, always get very pessimistic and, and upset about things. I think we have to, they, they use the word a lot of a paradigm shift. I think what's happened for sure is that everything has changed forever. And I think anybody, any government, any private sector thinks, oh, well, you know, how quickly can we just get back to 2008 is making a huge mistake. I think they all have to go back and think very strategically now, strategically from, uh, from the sectors that are producing uh, tourists to providing product for them rather than just providing product 
and thinking that they will come and book in the old-fashioned way. I think actually it's down to blank sheets of paper and strategic planning of the governments with private sectors, because tourism is always there, tourism will always come, it's just how we position it. Um, as um, Dr. Frenzel uh, is the chairman of one of the largest uh, two operators uh, in the world, I would like to, to hear from you um, uh, how you felt your business going on last year, the impact of the crisis, and your prospects for this year. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, we are all suffering the worst financial crisis uh, since 29, and this uh, had a, a strong impact in 09. And there will also be an impact in 010, that's clear. There are, uh, the impact uh, was very different from uh, source mark to source mark, from country to country. So uh, if you see our more or less, overall we have more than 30 million customers, mainly customers out of Europe. The <laughs> biggest market by far is Germany and UK, and there are other markets where we are market leader. So we have a clear view of what's going on in the market, and looking back in 09, uh, it was very clear that this financial crisis has a different impact in the uh, source markets. So the, the worst was, uh, in the beginning, was in the UK, clearly, and uh, Germany was quite interesting. Uh, Germany was uh, a little bit, if you look at the consumer confidence, uh, more optimistic. And uh, looking back to the bookings, the booking pattern shifted totally. There was a very, very a strong tendency to uh, last-minute bookings, very late bookings. At the end of the day, 09 was behind, clearly behind uh, uh, the last year, 08. But the big two operators managed, I think, to uh, uh, more or less uh, this development by uh, shortening the capacity, which on the other hand did not solve the problems of our partners of the hotels, because the capacity is in the world and they have to be used. So overall, uh, 09 was, uh, as you said, uh, not a very good year. And, uh, for us, it's very important what's happening in 010. Okay. I was on a discussion with our chancellor in last week in Berlin, and there were some uh, uh, more or less predictions, uh, presentations about predictions, what's happening in the world economy. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't believe in any predictions anymore, mm -hmm. but nobody really has seen the crisis coming. But on the other hand, if you see the, the overall and the uh, average understanding is there will be an upturn clearly in the next years. The basic question is how fast the upturn yes. is. Most, for me, reliable scenario is that there is a sort of sinus development. There is an upturn between 1.5, 3% in the world economy, and more or less our industries totally depend what's happening, I think, on the yes, economy. For sure. And for clearly. Sure. So looking to this, uh, we expect that there will be an upturn also in our, more or less, in our bookings, booking patterns. But uh, I believe. Uh, the consumer confidence is very different at the moment in the different okay. big countries. Going back to UK, UK is very interesting. UK is, uh, especially in the late bookings, was strong. Mm -hmm. We have uh, early signs in the United States, in the, especially in the last week, strong recovery, which gives us hope. I believe, by the way, that all the predictions, there's one prediction which is standard at the moment, that the world economy will be back on the level of 08 in 013. This means in five years, which okay. is a long term. Well, I, personally, I personally don't believe in these predictions. I believe it's mainly due to two developments. One is China, the growth in China and the United States. And the okay. relation between China and the United States, this is driving the economy. And so, uh, perhaps so you know we are... Let, let's pick up from that, from China, and yeah. uh, look at, uh, let's say, specifically on the tourism sector. And so I would like to ask uh, Chairman Zhu, uh, as China is one of the most, uh, world's most dynamic tourist destinations and the source market, how uh, did your country perform in terms of tourism uh, last year? 
and both international and domestic and uh, what do you see from now? Okay. Well, in the past year, for the global financial crisis and H1N1 flu hit the world tourism industry really seriously. So as far as the Chinese tourism is concerned, we have a strong support from the Chinese government and a combined efforts from the whole tourism industry. In China, we have managed to overcome the crisis. So in 2009, we have great achievements, especially for the outbound and also domestic tours. We just a little bit slightly, I mean, a slight decrease for the inbound. Mm -hmm. And so for the 2009, the domestic tourism in China has achieved a historical record for 1.9 billion person times, which is about 11% increase compared with the same period of the year before last. And also the outbound visitations numbered 48, 48 million, which is about 4% increase. And the inbound, I mean, the international arrivals numbered 126 million, uh, decrease about 2.7%. So the domestic tourism in China is really uh, developed so fast. For the international arrivals, from uh, especially for the second half of the year, we see the signs of the recovery. And especially uh, from the last quarter of the 2009, most of the Chinese major tourist generating countries and show great, I mean, positive recovery month by month. And uh, end of the year, so total uh, income for the tourism is about 189 billion US dollars, which is about 11.3% increase. Mm -hmm. So uh, generally speaking, 2009 is a really good year for China, and also we are made great achievements. And uh, we see the future, the strong growth for 2010 and 11, and that's it. Again, that's uh, good news uh, coming from uh, China to the rest of the world, as uh, the Chinese government put up uh, a lot of uh, measures last year to encourage economic growth and also uh, to encourage uh, uh, both uh, incoming and uh, outgoing tourism uh, so that it would also source uh, other markets, right? So, uh, Minister Gereko, uh, the global financial crisis significantly impacted the tourism industry in 2008, and uh, a response to the crisis, as a response to the crisis, Greece, uh, Greece took uh, several initiatives to promote the country abroad and support uh, tourism services and businesses. Uh, what do you envisage being the biggest challenge for 2010? Everyone knows that uh, 2009 was a difficult year indeed. Uh, for our, in Greece, I must say it wasn't so difficult in comparison to what we expected. We had uh, eight minor, of course, but it was a difficult time anyway for Greece. Uh, now, with a new government, um, only three months we are, uh, we really put the tourist industry from Greece as the most important sector for our economy. I must say that uh, tourism for Greece gives to us 18, even 20 percent on our GDP. We are dependent really for this industry. Mm -hmm. The maritime industry comes second. It's far from not so as tourism. So we are planning on a comprehensive strategic plan uh, really to face the difficulties of the year to come. And first of all, we want to eliminate as much as possible, and I think it's a very the strong enemy for development in tourism, the bureaucracy, and to make Greece more attractive for investors, even for Greek investors, that it comes out some, often because of the bureaucracy for the foreign investors. And then 
to support the green development uh, from tourism. And I think Greece is one of the countries that can do that. Rebrand our name because, as you know, Greece uh, comes from many years ago in the field of tourism, more than 15 years, so a mature destination. So we are really aware we have to change our branding, not only sun and sea that are very, who are very popular, certainly those elements that are precious for us, but then we want to enrich those elements and we can do it. Think that we have 6,000 islands in Greece and 15 kilometers of seafront, the half of European uh, seafront indeed. So each island has its own characteristics and then we have a beautiful really mainland so we can, our policy now is to extend the seasonal, let's say, touristic border we have into 12 months, if it's, if yes, it's possible, so. slowly, slowly. Mm -hmm. So just to grow up, another uh, really content, and then to open to another markets, big markets, mm -hmm. new international stars in our world of tourism, China, India, it's Russia, obviously. Yes. So uh -huh. obviously we really uh, support our collaboration with the traditional market as England, Germany, and we are working together with the big tour operators, but it's not enough. We have to exchange that, and we can do it in cooperation, obviously, with other countries. Okay, you have all the elements there to, to do that. Uh, I would like uh, to hear now from Mr. Christopher Rodriguez, how Visit Britain reacted uh, to mitigate the impact of the uh, world crisis on tourism, what measures uh, have been most effective from your side? Pleasure. I think there are, f to state the obvious, but sometimes the obvious needs stating, that there are four things that drive how Britain is seen as a tourist destination. One is the state of the economy. We've heard about that. It removes demand when the economy is weak. But it's important to remember that exchange rate, capaci capacity utilization, and pricing are very important. That was very important this year. When you then look at the segments of the industry, there is very little in my experience and in our experience that you can do to deal with the decline in business travel. Business travel is driven by the state of business economy. It is very important for many sectors in our industry, and it was clear a year ago that it was going to be a very bad year. Mm -hmm. Material decline. But the hotels are built, the restaurants are built, you have to do something about it. So for us, the action we decided to take just over a year ago was to absolutely focus on leisure. And Taleb talked earlier about one of the challenges of the industry being that it is very fragmented. Mm -hmm. One of the silver linings to the cloud of the economy is that when things are bad, people are much more inclined to work together. So we ended up with a single unified value campaign to tell the story about the relative attractiveness of Britain. Um, one thing captured that for me in the year. Uh, I was in New Zealand doing some promotional work and I was asked to be on television and to be interviewed. And the interviewer said, tell me, how does it compare for a New Zealander going to Britain this year compared to last year? And the answer was, it was 40% less expensive. And that's not uniquely New Zealand. If you combined currency, which was in our favor because we have a weak pound, mm -hmm. or weak, relatively weaker pound, with airline leisure rates, which were extremely aggressive, and hotel rates, which were extremely aggressive, in both cases trying to make up for the lack of business travel, you got a very, very significant price change. So what is the net of this? As we expected, business travel was bad. In our estimate, it is down 22% internationally into Britain, 8% domestically. That's very significant. The leisure market, mm -hmm we received a quarter of a million more travelers than we have ever done in history as a result of the value campaign. It's the best year we've ever had. Um, and if you add to that what happened in the domestic market, as 
Michael said, outbound leisure travel was down 15% from Britain because of the, of the exchange rate, not because of the economy, because of the exchange rate. Yeah? Four coffees on an inexpensive cafe in the Champs-Élysées is now 25 euro. Mm. Believe me, that looks expensive if you look at it from a British perspective. Um, domestic travel, the staycation, I hate the word, but it, it's a great business opportunity. Mm. Staying at home, domestic travel up 18%. So, so people are traveling closer of, to home. They're very close to home. They're not going over the border. So net, leisure has saved us. It is an extraordinary resilient industry. And to come back to a point that uh, Taleb said earlier, uh, and that's not helpful for the case that you make with government because if the industry is resilient, the government says it's the one thing we don't have to worry about. So we have, still have that challenge. But for us, the focus on the value story and the focus on leisure is what offset what would otherwise have been a terrible year because of the decline in business. But uh, as the, we start seeing many, in many countries the economy picking up again, uh, do you envisage changing this uh, promotional strategy no in the year of 2010, or you pretty much will stay in the same course? When we do our research about people's propensity to travel anywhere over, overseas, and we say, how do you think of Britain? The good news is it's a very attractive destination. It's a small island, but it's the sixth biggest destination in the world, so we have some assets we inherit. Contemporary culture, and London in particular, are extremely attractive. But because we have a big historical and cultural connotation, it's always there next year. I don't have to go this year, I can always go next year. Mm -hmm. So our first travel is to, the first challenge is to get people to come now. The second hi historic issue we've had for the last decade is the perception that Britain was very expensive. So it is the value story. God willing, and the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer assisting, the pound will not recover rapidly. I am one of the few people who is a great fan of what has happened, at least from my business perspective. And therefore, the message of value stays central. Mm -hmm. Many people want to do new campaigns every year. I'm old enough and long in the tooth enough in marketing to understand that it's not what I want to say, it's what customers or prospective customers hear and understand that matters. So we will continue the value story. We will continue the value story through to the Olympics and off the Ryder Cup this year and the Olympics in 2012. We will merchandise the attractions of Britain. No change in message. Okay. But uh, also given your privileged uh, knowledge on the UK market in general, uh, do you expect uh, this uh, very important key source uh, market, as Britain is for many countries, including Spain, uh, to rebound in 2010 and eventually in 2011? And, or do you expect uh, pretty much that uh, the British tourists will stay traveling more and more uh, closer to home? Three points. One is I think 2010 is a tougher year for most people in Britain than 2009 in the economy. First of all, the taxes are going up. In many ways, they were delayed. Secondly, the governments that, well, whoever is going to come into power has announced that it's going to be terrible and they're going to cut as many things as they can, and that means cutting employment, so that will be bad news. And therefore, I think the consumer sentiment will be at least as bad and possibly worse by the end of 2010. Okay. Uh, number one. Number two, so th I think that reduces demand. The good news is the British love to travel and ultimately the business will come back. The bad news, it's not gonna come back this year. The pound has not, it's not gonna change materially against the euro. The euro 
Yeah, but there's a policy issue for Euro, the Euro overall, which has nothing to do with tourism. Mm -hmm. Depending on where the Euro is in relation to the pound will depend the rate of recovery. My prediction, I'm afraid, for Spain is not good news. Do not expect to see a lot of British people this year. We were down 18%. If you're lucky, it'll be the same level. I don't think it will get worse, mm -hmm. but I don't think well, it's going to recover rapidly this year. That's the beginning of the good news. It's not going to be worse. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, you have uh, talked about uh, business, tra uh, business tourism and uh, leisure tourism, so I would like to hear from Mr. Petrocelli. Uh, uh, well, uh, American Express uh, uh, works with both uh, categories uh, very much throughout the world. And uh, also from the other panelists that we've heard uh, a bit about uh, source markets, do you see or which um, source markets do you see that are already recovering, if any? And uh, which ones do you see that uh, will take longer, longer to recover? Yeah. Before I answer directly your question and, and to bounce from what Chris was saying, and, yes. and because uh, Jeffrey and Dr. Frenzel are very much on, focus on the leisure side, let me just put the business travel aspect into perspective, okay, right? The, um, Business travel is a direct variable of the world economy. Mm -hmm. Companies are spending in travel when they want to reach out to new customers, to new markets, to partners, right? So is, as their revenue grow, business travel grows as a spend directly linked to their growth of their business. Um, the business travel also has an importance because it creates high yields for all, us in the industry, uh, hotels, um, airlines, car rentals, and etc. And it also doesn't have the seasonality of leisure. Actually, business travel travels except during the holidays when planes are full because of leisure. Mm -hmm. What have we seen in 2009? We've seen actually two distinct segments, right? If I can simplify that. The large market versus the small market. The large market deals with business travel as a discretionary expenses, like it deals with uh, advertising. Decision was made to cut and to cut early. And some companies have cut as low as 70%. You know, you address the expense and you say, I'm going to freeze business travel. I'm going to stop traveling. I'm going to stop my people to travel. And when companies are spending in the large market between, I would say, $30 million to $500, 600 million a year, you see the immediate impact to the, to the industry, right? The, the smaller segment, to simplify it, was actually not as impacted because the smaller segment is very cost conscious has always been, because it's their money. They see their money immediately, you know. The traveler is the owner, is the spender. And so they spend with their cost conscious, and also they spend if they have business to go after with. So there was a double impact in that, in, in that overall drop. One, the volume impact. Second, the, the yield impact, because of course, less volume, uh, load factor were reduced. So operators, airlines, hotels, etc., have started to reduce the price. And so the overall value of business travel was at a double effect from a negative point of view. What are we seeing in the last, um, in the last six to eight weeks, I would say, to be, to be conservative? We've seen a, a, a return to a positive growth versus last year, same quarter, right? Same period. Don't forget last year was already down, right? So, the growth that we see is not, exactly, the growth that we see is not versus 2007, which could be a benchmark mark year, but 2008, which was already negative, right? We also see that growth much more, we see the growth in the U.S., we see it in JAPA, in Asia Pacific, um, uh, China, uh, except Japan, and we see that growth fairly aggressive in JAPA, much faster than we see it in the U.S. We don't see it in Europe yet. Uh, there, is, there is, except for one or two markets, the growth is not as aggressive in Europe. And the key question we're asking ourselves when we discuss with other members of the industry is what will be the shape of 2010? And there are two hypotheses in the shape of 2010. One hypothesis is the, I would say, the optimist one. It's the, the V shape or the U shape, right? Whatever you want to call it. So it went down, it bottomed out, and it's now starting to come back up. The V could be Y, but it's a V. That's one hypothesis. There is another hypothesis, which I believe should not be disregarded, 
It's the square root shape, <laughs> which is what we see now mm -hmm. is actually pent up demand that is being released, mm -hmm. was blocked, frozen at the beginning of the year, and is being released now. So it's coming back up, but then it will level out and Imagine level the out. Same levels of last year. Potentially, you know, better or, than last year, but certainly lower than where it started from in 2007. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, how long will that horizontal mm -hmm. shape afterwards? And the key question for us at the moment is, how do you create enough flexibility in the industry, from an airline point of view, from a hotel point of view, from an operator point of view, in order to be able to deal well with the two hypotheses that we're thinking about at the moment? Okay. Okay, uh, and uh, does it uh, match very much? Uh, does it match very much uh, with what you have been seeing uh, in your source markets? And and uh, also, I would like to ask you, Dr. Frenzel, uh, which destinations will be, to your point of view, the first ones to to uh, let's say to benefit from the recovery, and uh, which uh, source markets will be the first ones to rebound? Uh, it's very interesting. Perhaps we will come back later to Spain and the development compared to the other source markets, but what we can clearly see at the moment, and this is mainly, in my view, impact of the financial crisis and that the customers are looking for value for money or simply for price, that those destinations who are in the price competition ahead are winning at the moment, mm -hmm. clearly. Uh, and uh, basically, to be quite clear, uh, Turkey, for example, is uh, at the moment what we see for summer 10 clearly ahead, clearly ahead, with double-digit growth, whereas Spain is still behind. And uh, basically, this is a more or less a flashlight at the moment because we are very early in summer and we have uh, experienced late bookings, as I mentioned before. But clearly, there's a tendency, if you see the big source markets coming back to UK, which is uh, driven by the pound, the shift from UK to Spain, and uh, there were more than 10 million uh, visitors from UK to Spain. This shift is uh, more now going uh, to the non-euro countries, clearly, totally driven by the currency. Basically, the question, the big question we have to face here in Madrid and in Spain, what is the answer for Spain? And the question is, do we have a structural problem here or is the problem at the moment only the, uh, the uh, outcome of the financial crisis? Mm -hmm. And perhaps we can discuss this more yes. in, in, in depth, but uh, I believe there's not an easy answer. There's a mixtum, I believe. And uh, we, as the biggest tour operator in Europe, we are very, very close to Spain. Spain is by far still our biggest market with 8 million customers as a company here. Uh, Turkey is uh, today 50% of this, roughly 4 million, growing year by year. Yes. And basically the question is, uh, and Spain is attractive, no question here. The basic question is, how could we come back to a, a competitiveness, competitive, yes. uh, more or less, maybe offerings here and product in Spain? This is the question. Maybe question. we can pick up... Uh, later on on Spain again yep. uh, and extend a little bit uh, more but uh, before we go into that I uh, let's say maybe Jeffrey Kent could tell us a little bit more about uh, or a, a bit about uh, the high-end income tourists in which uh, his company is very much uh, specialized and you operate with uh, uh, an enormous variety of source markets and also you uh, take tourists to all over the world they are uh, ones that uh, like adventure and spe special cultural uh, features. And how was it for this uh, high-end uh, income segment last year? Was it better than the whole market? Uh, uh, and how do you see it uh, as uh, its pers perspectives for this year? Well, I have to say all of my life is I've, I've gone under the theory that if you have a travel product to sell, it's better to sell it to a rich person than a poor person, right? And so uh, we're hearing from Christopher about the uh, sterling, and then I decided that I should sell it to all the rich people all over the world, just to one segment of rich people, because they tend to lose their money at, uh, on occasion. So <clears throat> I think that all the years of work that I've, I've put into the industry over the years has paid off in, over this downtime. So to be honest, uh, we, we at the high end have fared actually pretty well in 2009. 
Not bad at all. Um, Not we've, bad at all. Oh. We've, had a, we've had a good year, and 2010, um, I think uh, Michael said that the U.S. market, it's rebounding very, very fast. And I'm not sure why, but it is. December, January, February, like, uh, like times three over last year. So we're feeling very buoyant about the United States market. But what we have learned in tourism, and it's a big lesson, uh, I think, especially in the high end, is that uh, these people are very discerning. They're very well educated. They're very discerning. And actually, they can go anywhere, anytime. And just as Christopher said, how do you, want, how do you make them uh, go to England? Well, you know, if the weather's bad, they're not going to go. And England's always there anyhow. And so <laughs> you have to, uh, that's why you, you have to think of what is, uh, especially from, for instance in Spain, you've really got to promote festivals. This is the last time you'd see a festival ever like this again. You have to make it like a one-off. And you have to, above all, really go into the experience, experience of travel. What I found is it's, much harder to do that than to, than to talk about it because all experiential travel needs, of course, it needs great geographies, great locations, but it also needs great guides. And actually to find great guides, this is what government should take note of, is almost impossible uh, in, in the tourist sector because uh, they're just, you know, highly educated people, sadly, don't seem to enter tourism at that level. And so we have always been promoting that with governments. We have our own guide training school. But this is what I really exhort people to do, because intelligent people want experiential travel, and, but they want to go with somebody from whom they will experience it and to meet local people, local traditions, local culture. And so I think it's a huge area of tourism that has not been attacked because it's difficult, difficult to understand. They expect uh, great interaction with the local people. <clears throat> because it does. I mean, it, it spreads the wealth throughout because it's the local restaurants, they love to go local markets, they love to see local artisans, they love to go to local uh, and, you know, antique shops, they like to be local painters. It's, it's fantastic for the country. Yes, yes. but uh, uh, I think that's also a trend for not the, the so high uh, income people. I think tourists more and more, and if you come down to the, let's say, to a lower income, not to low income, but uh, <laughs> middle uh, class uh, people, they also want to experience, they also want to experience local culture and I think uh, that's good news for the whole tourism sector and that's good news for destinations, they have to, uh, to work more to show what they have and that will uh, be a very important point to attract uh, new visitors, right? I, I agree with you too, one shouldn't just say, oh well experiential travel is just an elite a pastime for wealthy clients, it's not. But I think that when you start there, and that, that will get, you have to change your mindset. This is, again, it's the paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. You know, from mass tourism to a beach, to, to more cultured, more traditional tourism, to other areas of the country. And it's, it's a big change, yes. a big mindset change. Big change. But you cannot do it without guides. Mm -hmm. And these are very, this is, this is employment. And governments have to wake up about tourism. I've been preaching this all my life. It's not so much about the capital or the money coming into the country. It's about jobs. I mean, you know, what we but preach at World Travel and Tourism Council is we represent 9.1% of the world's jobs. It's 230 million jobs. I think we're down 10 million this year, so we're 220 million jobs. It's jobs. And I remember when we were in Brazil, meeting with the president of Brazil, he absolutely, fully, and completely understood the value of tourism, which was for job creation. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, people who work uh, at the ministries throughout the world, and I had that uh, personal experience, if we are to select one, only, uh, uh, only one uh, goal, it would be job creation. Yes. Well, there are other important ones, uh, like uh, international receipts, but job creation is the, the key. Yes, yes Mr. The, and actually. And actually, th this, the point that, that Jeffrey is making is very important because there is a, di there is a dichotomy in travel in the sense that uh, between the origin and destination markets, in travel, export is bad, import is good because export doesn't help the balance of trade. Import um, helps the balance of trade, right? So the, the key question for us is how do you deal with this dichotomy between what... Uh, what uh, Chris was saying for the UK, where the value of the pound is low and the interest of the UK is to develop domestic market, expand domestic market, mm -hmm. while the value of Spain is to bring uh, customers into Spain, which are actually negative to the balance of trade of the UK in a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer of that 
and that all governments and all institutions should understand is we are an industry that has the facility to create job extremely fast. Mm -hmm. Because we're an industry which is spread around multiple smaller, mid-sized companies that as soon as there is movement, we can create job either in outbound countries or in, um, in inbound countries. Mm -hmm. and, and protectionism decisions that are being made in order to, 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 to protect the balance of trade are maybe not a benefit to the job creation that could be created in origin markets mm -hmm. as much as they will be created in inbound markets. Okay, uh, so let's uh, pick up from that point in terms of public policies. And uh, what, uh, uh, and I ask uh, the private sector, and then I would like to hear the, some reactions from uh, uh, Minister Selja and also from Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, what, uh, uh, Mr. Dr. French said, uh, in terms of public policies, which type of measures should governments to focus on in this period of recovery? Uh, is it uh, promotion? Is it uh, support to, uh, to product diversification, innovation? Or also they should start uh, going into or thinking of the infrastructure development as well in this period of recovery? I believe we have to differentiate between short-term uh, more or less actions and more structural long-term actions. And basically the answer is uh, for every destination uh, and every source market very different. Uh, for example, coming back to Spain here, short-term answer and long-term answer. The long-term answer has to do with the profile of the product, clearly. Uh, if a destination, that's not only Spain, there are other also major destinations uh, in uh, uh, Europe, like Greece, like Italy. These are mature destinations, which have a history of 40, 50 years of tourism, which are totally different to Turkey, for example, which is a new destination with a new hotel infrastructure with new investments. And therefore, the answer in the destinations of the, of the governments must be different, clearly. One of the points is short term, clearly, is uh, basically the question is how to keep competitiveness of their own product. This is, I think, the main issue for all of the governments. And there is a high competition in Europe between the destinations. And if you see the investments in the last 10 years, for example, in Tenerife, in Canaries, in Spain, everywhere, where huge capacities are built up. And the new destinations like Tunisia, Morocco, or Turkey, where also new capacities are coming up. This is more or less, I think, the, the landscape there where every single, more or less, government has to decide, to decide what to do. And be quite clear, for Spain, it's important to keep the leading position in Europe here and to play with the natural, more or less, resources. It's important for Greece, it's important for Italy, for example, to keep this. Uh, the, customer is not a, uh, the customer is a complex uh, personality. Uh, there's not one tourist, there are segmentations of tourists, clearly. And uh, the customer also wants, more or less, to shift from one destination to another. So it's not a play, uh, it's an illusion to, uh, more or less, to attract a customer forever to one destination. There, there are so many change. destinations at hand uh, so, yeah. nowadays, right? So the long-term answer is clearly, basically, the question, it was mentioned in the speech here, do we have to reinvent, this is a big word, reinvent tourism in Spain. Do we have to reinvent tourism in Greece? Everybody in the mature destinations has to think, how can the product be more attractive in this competitiveness? And this starts with infrastructure, and this is where more or less the, the government has the, the biggest tool. Infrastructure means airports, infrastructure means some supports for local investment in hotels, infrastructure means renewal of like the, the project Playa de Palma or other projects in Spain here, renewing older uh, more or less destinations and renewing more or less infrastructure here and uh, then to face, very important, the question and to answer the question, what is the customer of the future? This is the most important point. There are not a simple answer. There are no simple answers in our industry. We are more, much more complex than the outside always thinks. Mm -hmm. The customer, our customer, major customer, 50% of our major customer is elder than 50 years. So dem demographics is one of the big challenges for our industry. This will change the product. The other point, this new lifestyle customer, 
We call it, uh, we have a more or less a study which shows that we call it LOHAS. It means a lifestyle of health and sustainability. These are people who are very much more or less uh, determined to uh, environmental questions, which have an own lifestyle, which are not against uh, consumption, but very much in favor, but on their own yes. way. And uh, our studies show that more than 25% in the next years of the population will be very close to this lifestyle. So they are looking for additional value. And it's not simply sun and beach anymore. There must be more. And what the governments have to face in every destination, in Spain and in other destinations, is what is their answer, their own answer, <coughs> for this uh, sort of customer. And this is a very complex, and, but a very interesting and challenging question okay. for us. And uh, Minister Selja, how do you see that uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, more short-term short uh, measures and also on the long-term long things that uh, were mentioned here? And also, uh, there was a very important point that uh, Mr. Kent also raised, uh, which is job creation, and uh, that's uh, uh, something very dear to all of us, but especially to you, who is responsible for another ministerial portfolio and has to do with, with uh, poverty alleviation. Uh, you see, in India, we, uh, while tourism contributes about 6% to the GDP, it also contributes 9% to the employment sector. And uh, we recognize that while uh, we have to go in for major aggressive promotion abroad, Incidentally, I might mention here that uh, recently our uh, Incredible India marketing campaign won the Grand Prix along with uh, the marketing campaign of Segovia in Spain. And uh, while we go uh, about uh, with our promotion, we also recognize the fact that it will lead to a major, major job creation within India. The Prime Minister has set up a skill development mission and uh, tourism will contribute in a major way towards that. And uh, we need to synergize between uh, different sectors. And uh, job creation is definitely one of the major areas of focus in our country. For instance, to give you an example, at the moment, we uh, have a shortage of about 200,000 people in this uh, service sector, service providers for tourism industry, and uh, in the future, we are going uh, in for major emphasis on uh, job creations. And uh, since, as you pointed out, I hold two ministries, I'm wearing two hats, we are also trying to see how best to synergize between two and uh, provide a platform for not only skill training, but also skill development. I would also, uh, while we're on the subject, uh, share with you that uh, India has uh, recently, in terms of um, promoting tourism, we have uh, recently gone on for visa on arrival for five countries, Finland, Luxembourg, Japan, Singapore, New Zealand, and uh, this is uh, something very new for us. It was demanded by the private sector for a long time and uh, we have introduced it this year. We have 18 countries on our long-term visa list. And in India, we actually look for repeat visitors. We have a lot of repeat visitors in India because those who come once must come again to uh, see our incredible India. We have so much culture, as it was pointed out. We have so much culture, heritage, not just beaches, wildlife, adventure, you name it, we have it. Yeah, that's true, that's true. And uh, uh, Minister Gereko, in the, the case of Greece, uh, I understand that a major change has taken place in uh, the relationship between tourism and culture. And uh, you were mentioning, uh, you were touching on this before. Uh, and what is it about? What is this major change and uh, what do you want to, to put in place? That's true, we have a new ministry culture and tourism together, we combine those fields. Uh, we are focusing now more on, uh, let's say, um, more creative approach to this concept. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree totally with General Tui that it's said before that uh, 
any country of those mature destinations, we are mature destinations, we have to change and renovate our products and to show how, what is our comparative, uh, let's say, um, advantage. So one of the most important comparative advantage for us is our culture and nature. Mm -hmm. So we totally really uh, recognize the national, let's say, importance of culture and the business nature of tourism. And we expand this not only for the Asian uh, culture and Asian Greece, to the modern way of life of the modern Greece, uh, with festivals, with um, gastronomic kind of tourism, with uh, our tradition, with uh, our identity, this multi-phase identity of Greece. That comes to add what I said before, that we want to rebrand our name and be more attractive in a new market that's a lot of we find a lot of uh, competitors around, mm -hmm. friendly competitors, but still we, we are in, in, in play, one place that really want to invest and to support our industry. So um, I must say that it comes out that we are passing really uncertain period for the tourism, but still we believe and I believe personally that uh, uh, this kind of industry, the tourism industry, it helped us and the country that we are dependent from this to come out of this crisis. That's why we have to support, to invest, to open new markets, but to, to achieve that, we have, we have certainly uh, collaborate with the private sector. Public and private sector can find their way and their area to work together and to give the best results. And to open, open uh, the other markets, as I, I said before, we have to work on a wide system of air transportation. Mm -hmm. So that's why our ministry, the Ministry for Transportation, we are working together, we already have a team of expertise to work on this and to collaborate with other countries in order to open those markets yeah. and to be really different, to, to make really this difference our arm in front of this crisis. Yeah. That's one of the jobs of the, let's say, the tourism authorities. They have to coordinate well uh, with other uh, areas of government. And uh, yes, I, I will give you an example. What I mean, what I say, that we we combine culture, tourism, and sports together because now our ministry will have sports together. Uh, this year we celebrate in Greece the 2,500 years from the Battle of Marathon and the classical marathon together. Okay. You can imagine if we support that, we are going to do it, how it's important for all to this event. Well, a lot of people there, million, um, thousands of people that come in Greece, so we put again, you know, an industry point to meet each other. Then our Acropolis, new Acropolis Museum, that in eight months gave to us uh, one million and a half visitors. You can imagine how we can extend that in city breaks, in other things, we have to elaborate to give this new product, renovate touristic product from Greece. Okay. May I add yes, something? Please. Talking about government and government help or government action, just uh, to use the stage here, Brussels is a big topic for us. Uh, because at the moment, I believe that the European tourism industry needs a, a common uh, initiative to go to Brussels and explain the restrictions at the moment. We are all dependent, and all destinations are dependent on a strong air connection. So there must be attractive flight connections, otherwise all the destinations have problems. If you see what's going on in, in Brussels on the political uh, part, we have a denied boarding question, which is a big question in the UK, especially denied boarding. I fully understand to protect the consumer and the client on the one hand, but on the other hand, I think to imply rules which at the end of the day leads to the impact that for our airline it's a double digit million euro more or less a burden and for all the airlines this will more or less hurt the airline industry or emission trading is another point which is coming from the uh, power plant industry going now to the airline industry we are operating 120 planes 140 planes so we are deeply and the airline is it was mentioned before, also the airline industry is in a crisis. And if the airline industry is additional, more or less, suffering through uh, governmental restrictions, I think this will deepen the crisis. So there are some points we can really, on, also on a European level, I think, start initiatives.
Okay, I, I would like to go back to China for a mon moment, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Chairman Zhu, uh, which segments in China do you see that will excel, that will be the top, uh, will have the top demands uh, in 2010 and 2011? You see, as you know, uh, China developed tourism started from 1980s. So at that time, the infrastructure, the facilities, even the service is not as good as other countries. So uh, for the last decade, we usually have the package tours for just for the sightseeing, for the cultural tours. But nowadays, it's totally different. After 20 years development in China, with the, you have so many five-star hotels, the beautiful airports, that's even the service, and a lot of people can speak English. The traveling in China became more easier. So now we have lots of businessmen came to China every year, and also, of course, you have the, the conventions, incentives, and of course, lots of exhibitions. Mm -hmm. And also nowadays, in Chinese government, encourage local government to build lots of holiday resorts in China. So now we have people from other countries to stay in holiday resorts. So for the future, we have different kinds of people from different countries, not only the sightseeing and the cultural tours. And also, of course, that 2010 is an important year for China. As you know, the Shanghai Water Expo will be held in Shanghai in May to October. So uh, as the authority in charge of tourism, our goal is that we will meet 70,000 people for that period. Among them, about 3.0 million people from overseas. So uh, in average, we have 400,000 people per day in the Shanghai Expo. So this is a great challenge for us. But we are full of confidence because we already seen the recovery. For instance, for the last four months, we have people, even the long haul market like Australia and Canada, we have a double digit increase for the last four months already. And also for the neighboring countries like India, Thailand, they played very well. And each month, about 7 to 9% increase. So I should say, uh, China tourism, we are full of confidence and we'll finish the goal for 70,000 people. So, uh, Take this occasion, I would like to invite you, all of you to visit Shanghai, visit China, and also to see your beautiful pavilions of your own country. Most people here, or many people here will be there for sure. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Rodriguez, uh, which uh, segments do you think will excel in Britain as uh, you were, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, earlier on that uh, there's great value for money for people who go there? I think the, the drivers of growth are varied. If I was looking at a single person that I would want to give an award to for promoting tourism, it would be the mayor of the city of London. Because business tourism is absolutely... Business tourism... <laughs> <laughs> business tourism is absolutely driven by business activity. People don't go on business where they don't want to do business. So, you know, as you look at all countries, that sector depends on chi China's destination. China as a business destination is of increasing importance to almost everyone in the world. They will inevitably benefit from a considerable growth in business travel. The discretionary travel is leisure. So, leisure depends, we've talked, many people have talked about, exper about experiences. Leisure depends on creating experiences. Central governments don't do that. Local public-private sector partnerships create destinations. Often, and there are they often create that out of nothing. You see regeneration I remember when we were doing Liverpool Capital of Culture. Most of the British thought that that was a very 
funny idea because Britain couldn't, Liverpool couldn't be a capital of culture. I remember talking to someone in Milan about uh, how they viewed Liverpool and the Milanese, the Northern Italians, are very interested in architecture. So the Liverpool culture story is one of Victorian architecture. You have to get the... You have no mic. You have to get the right story for the right market, the right segment. So the real challenge for government is to, you know, this is ultimately an entrepreneurial private sector industry. It's the great strength of this industry. There are passionate individuals who create wonderful things to experience, to see, to do. And communities create that. So a government at the center has to encourage that community activity, and as Dr. Frenzel says, at a high level it has to deal with employment, it has to deal with training, it has to deal with infrastructure, and often, certainly in the UK, and I think across Europe, it has to deal with red tape, bureaucracy. Uh, it's very difficult to do anything innovative without a huge amount of endeavor and for small businesses, that can destroy their will to live. So if you want tourism to thrive, you need to create, a government needs to care about it, it needs to understand how to make it competitive, and it needs to enable local people to be hugely successful, which comes back to Jeffrey's point. What he sells is his engagement with wonderful local people who he's found, he's, that's what he does. But I have one last thought, and it applies to Spain, and I think what we, what maybe FITUR and WTTC can do. When you talk to people who are in the tourism industry, to ministers, with the exception of ministers that we have here, they are, they very rarely understand the competitive position of their, their country. And the reason is a good political one. It is politically incorrect often for ministers in a government to go outside their country on holiday. They all want to say, certainly in the UK, that I took advantage of the wonderful attractions of Britain or of Baden-Württemberg or wherever. So the competitive analysis, the competitive awareness is low. Yet we in the industry know what goes on in every country. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we collectively need to think about is how we create awareness of the competitive framework because there are great activities all over the world and if each of our nations simply followed best practice yes it would increase competition but the whole level of the industry would rise we have to give the politicians visibility as to what is best practice and what is bad practice okay uh... <laughs> Uh, thank you. I, picking up on that uh, as well, and uh, here we have a large uh, uh, Spanish or, uh, audience, I would like to ask Dr. Frenzel, who has been working for a long time uh, with uh, Spain, how do you see what are the most important features to position or to better position Spain uh, which is a synonym of tourism, as uh, Mr. Iscario said in the beginning, to many countries, uh, Spain is a synonym of tourism, how to position it in the future competition with other destinations. What are the main features that uh, the Spanish government and the private sector uh, uh, should look at? Uh, let me start with my remarks uh, from the beginning. I believe basically What's uh, going on in Spain at the moment, the decline in the last two or three years was uh, partly impact of the financial crisis of the economies, but partly also structural. And first of all, and uh, I want to pick it up, we have to have a, a very open, friendly, constructive dialogue with the government about the reasons. And basically, the first question is to have a clear, realistic picture of the competitiveness of the own destinations. Mm -hmm. And therefore, at the beginning, and I also believe in private-public uh, partnerships here, and uh, what we are doing is we are offering all the local governments our experience, and uh, this must be under friends, and we have a lot of friends in different destinations here, a very open dialogue. First of all, 
a very clear picture where are the weaknesses and the strengths of the destinations are. Coming to Spain, Spain has a lot of strengths, and this was the reason Spain was so fast for growing in the, in, the, in the past year. And basically, if you see beside uh, the Canaries with uh, uh, one year, whole year destination, weather like, and uh, from the more or less uh, uh, question how to reach this with a, with a very dense uh, flight connection. Uh, Spain is very close and very uh, close connected to the development of European tourism and it started very early because there is the resources which are unique. There is a strong more or less uh, combination between cultural uh, issues, uh, not only sun and beach, and there is, uh, and this is a big, for me, the big competitive advantage, the integration between a social environment, a secure social environment with culture behind and uh, a, a huge offering of uh, hotels. Mm -hmm. So we have to pick this up. And basically, this destination is uh, 50 years old. And uh, there are some parts in the mainland and on the islands which have to be renovated somehow. And there is uh, an urgent need, I think, for a public-private uh, partnership, I think, to define the weaknesses here, openly address the weaknesses, and then to look for solutions. What are the solutions? One of the solutions is clearly, I think, to go forward, go on with the renovations of some parts, like Playa de Palma, like in Andalusia, uh, like in other parts of Spain, to have a clear picture. Second question is clearly, and this is fully, I think, to the private uh, sector here, hotel sector, how can we increase the attractiveness of the hotels? Uh, there is a base problem of cost structures, and this is one of the big problems we have to, compared to other newer destinations where the cost structures are totally different. And if, for example, I learned it yesterday, I think the uh, reception guy is paid uh, 10 times more in Spain than in other countries, then you have a problem uh, to, to deal with the cost structures here. So we need also on the uh, more or less uh, employee market here a common initiative between uh, government and between, and between the uh, private sector here to create really a competitive <coughs> cost structure, which is the most, I think, complicated. Because I know there are a lot of uh, different uh, unions, there are a lot, lot of government uh, uh, opinions about this, but the competitiveness of, the, of, of one destination is uh, the key, I think, for the development. I believe in Spain. Spain has a very, very strong background, has a very strong basic here, and uh, we have really, I think, to work together to enhance this, uh, that Spain uh, keeps his strong position. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I've been uh, told here that uh, we have run out of time, so uh, there would be another theme that uh, I wanted to bring about, but uh, I'll leave uh, as something for us to, to think about and uh, eventually uh, talk in another panel, which is the fact that uh, two to three years ago, uh, the world economy was booming and so was tourism. But uh, there was a lot of volatility in commodity prices, energy and food prices and food commodities. Uh, and uh, very few people saw that. But environmental and climate change uh, were already concerns that had been, were being discussed for many years. Now, what uh, we see now is a simple or a mere period of recovery or rather a period of transformation. And uh, as this situation, this whole situation is over in a couple of years, uh, uh, will be business back to normal? Will it be business as usual? Or we will have another pattern of uh, destinations and uh, consumers? Uh, it's a very important issue, but uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time so I would like to finish here asking the audience a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you.